why doesn't God heal now? It's time for Wretched. It's moronic! <laughs> Would you consider yourself to be a good dog? We're on fire! You're sort of ruining the mood. You're intolerant, judgmental, and narrow-minded. You're everything that's wrong in this world. Oh, law, gospel. Jesus paid it all. Who could ask for anything more? Hello, and welcome to A Wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host. The wretch the song refers to uh, is there anything more painful than a parent watching his or her own child sick or even dying? Dear Raphael, I used to ride a bus along Blackburn Road. Every day a young man named George would count out his money to the driver and cautiously find his seat. Every day his father wore the same tattered flannel shirt. Every day the same smile would break through those deep and complex lines that creased his face. Only then would his father wave to George and slowly walk away. George was off to work again, and the next day they'd repeat the same ritual. Year after year after year. I used to wonder how this amazing dad kept doing this day after day. And then I became a father of a boy with special needs too. And now I understand the man on Blackburn Road. Now I know that a father's love is enough. Your boy is your boy, and it's the only reason you need. It's not even a reason, it's, it's more like breathing comes out of your pores. It's who you've become. You're born in a very special way. You're wonderfully made. To me, you've always been and always will be perfectly full of potential. You see, even a long life is short. And a short life can be full of meaning. In Isaiah 55, it says that the rain falls on the earth and accomplishes what it was sent out to do, to water plants and bring life to many. And all of us hope and pray that our lives too will accomplish purpose and have meaning. And Raphael, this is why I'm so proud of you. Your life has been profoundly meaningful. Every time we saw you on an ultrasound, we also saw your heart beating away and you squirming as best you could. And we could see that you were getting 100% out of that body that you were given. We knew from the beginning that you were a fighter, tough and strong. The doctors marveled at how you kept going. It makes us think that you had another source sustaining you. You made it to your birthday. You lived something like 20 peaceful, beautiful minutes. You spent almost all of them in my arms and next to your mum. You slipped away so peacefully that we only knew you were gone by the subtlest of changes in your expression. And I'm sad that I'll not have the privilege of walking you to the bus and making sure you're safely on your way to work each day. I would have done it without a moment's hesitation if it meant that I could have more time with you on this earth. You've made us the proudest of parents. You could not have done anything more to make us happy. Your life is perfect. 
Super, super job, my son. I love you so very much, and I burst with pride in you and, and who you are. And now I pray that in the presence of God, you're living out the promise expressed by your name, Raphael. God has healed. All my love. Raphael, God has healed, but the question remains, why didn't he do it now? There's no sensitive way to present this bite of information that puts it all in perspective because the reality is sin is a drag. The consequences of the fall are hard and it is no more difficult than when we see a child sick or die before we believe that he or she should. But I think the great dad that you just saw said it right, even a long life is short. God is the author of life. He's the sustainer of life. He's the taker of life. And you and I have to rest in knowing that his decisions for when lives begin and when they end are indeed best. Do we believe the promise of Romans 8 that God works out all things for our good, even painful things, hard things, difficult things, tragic things? When we come back on Wretched, we will try to resolve the question if, if healing, physical healing for our bodies was accomplished by Jesus in the atonement, why isn't everybody healed right now? Next on Wretched. Why doesn't God heal now? Welcome back to our Wretched. It is a difficult concept to grasp that it is ultimately God's prerogative when he chooses to give life and when he determines to take life away. But ultimately, if we believe that he knows best about everything, that is the ultimate comfort. He knows what is best. We do not have a high priest who is not sympathetic to our plight and our situation. We do not have a high priest who is not familiar with the grief and the pain that comes from a premature death. Consider the death of Lazarus. Jesus wept. Why? Because when a young man dies at an early age, it is sad and we have permission. There is a time for mourning. There is a time for grieving because premature deaths are a tragedy. However, there are some people who would teach that God actually can heal everybody now because it was made available in the atonement. Now, as an aside, before we try to tackle that theological question, I would like for you to consider the pastoral and the practical implications of that wrong theology. People will say that God can heal everybody right now because of what Jesus did on the cross. They cite Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes we are healed. What Jesus did on the cross provides for our physical healing. Now you just got to figure out a way to get it because it's there for you. How many broken-hearted parents has that created? How many grieving widows continue to weep because their spouse died and they weren't able to tap in to the healing in the atonement? Practically, pastorally, it is painful and it is wicked, but I also just don't think that it is right. Would like to share with you a concept called mountaintop prophecies. That's right, mountaintop prophecies. We actually talk about this in Herman Who, available at Wretched.tv. In the Old Testament, God gives prophecies to prophets like Isaiah, but they are sometimes 
mountaintop prophecies. What do, what do we mean by that? Well, if I take a look at a mountain range, that's what this is. If I take a look at a mountain range, and I'm, I'm, say I'm standing about here, and I'm looking at the mountain range. Maybe you've done this. How close is this mountain to this mountain? If I'm standing here and just looking at the tops, they look really, really close. I have to then make my way, traverse the mountains, climb the mountains to realize, whoa, from here to there, that's a long distance. Sometimes God does that in prophecies. Inside of one prophetic utterance, the prophet standing here will give a bunch of future predictions and he'll give one that's here, and he'll give one about here, and he'll give one about here, and he'll give one about here, and they look really close because they're written together. But they're really mountaintop prophecies. This one maybe happened immediately, and then this one perhaps in 100 years, this one in 300 years, and 500 years, and only time reveals when the fulfillment of the prophecy is going to take place. This is important when we understand what is going on in Isaiah 53. I think we could have a mountaintop prophecy going on in Isaiah 53, that great section of Scripture written 700 years before the life and death of Jesus Christ describing precisely how He would die. You recall that He would be so beaten, so brutally abused by men, you couldn't even tell He was a human being, that He would be killed by man, and we thought that it was for his sins, but it was for our sins. It's a great gospel prophecy. Inside of Isaiah 53, though, it talks about, by his stripes we are healed. Is it possible that Isaiah was giving us a glimpse at different times in redemptive history, the work of Jesus Christ, that when he comes and dies on a cross, our sins would be forgiven? But could it be that physical healing won't happen until later because it's a mountaintop prophecy. First of all, I think that the context of Isaiah 53 really is about forgiveness of sins and a spiritual healing. So when you read through Isaiah 53, which I encourage you to do, it's a great text to show to Jewish people and then ask them, so when do you think this was written? Who do you think this is talking about? They're going to say, well, it's talking about Jesus. Right, but it was written by Isaiah 700 years before he lived. When you read through it, I think the context would basically state this is about spiritual healing and forgiveness of sins, but there's a little bit of a problem. If you scoot on over to the New Testament, Matthew 8, 17, Jesus is healing a bunch of people, and Matthew uses Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes we are healed, to talk about physical healings. Uh oh what do we do now, Scooby? I would like to suggest to you two uh, possible understandings of that. First of all, Jesus did indeed fulfill that prophecy when he was healing all of Israel. Remember, Jesus healed virtually everybody in the nation of Israel. So perhaps the by his stripes we are healed was actually fulfilled by Jesus when he was healing people. But could it also be that it was a mountaintop prophecy? That by the atoning work of Jesus Christ, we will indeed be physically healed, but not now, not yet. We are forgiven now, but we are not physically healed yet. In other words, could it be that we've got ourselves a mountaintop prophecy going on here? That what we see is Jesus with his atoning work on the cross, he is accomplishing the forgiveness of our sins, but the physical healing won't come until we get to heaven. So you could say, if you want to take a look at the 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 context of the verses in Matthew 8, 17 and in Isaiah 53, 5, that physical healing was made available in the atonement, but we won't get it until we die. Therefore, everybody, you and I, we will be healed. All of us will be healed one day. How do I know this? Revelation tells me so. When you read through Revelation 21 and 22, what do we see? We see a hearkening back to the original time in the garden. What did we see in the garden? We saw a river and two trees. What do we see in Revelation 22? We see a river and two trees. And what are these two trees? For the healing of the nations, where you and I will be physically built for eternity, no disease, no sorrow, no sadness, no tears, 
no death, no deterioration, all gone because of the atoning work of Jesus. Now, perhaps you're not buying my little mountaintop explanation. I will try to persuade you yet again next on Wretched. How close are these two dolls? Would you have guessed that close? Welcome back to Wretched. It is difficult to tell the distance between these two, whatever these things are that were made in Ukraine by the Tomorrow Clubs, because of your perspective. You can't tell how far or how near they are. And the same thing is true with biblical prophecies. In the Old Testament, a prophet would deliver a lengthy prophecy to the people, and some of those prophecies would be fulfilled right away. Some of them took a long, long time. Some of them haven't even been fulfilled yet. They're going to happen in the end of times. And from the perspective of the original audience, you can't really tell how close those prophecies are until time actually unfolds and we see those prophecies revealed. This has huge implications hermeneutically, theologically, and practically for you. I would like to share with you another example of mountaintop prophecies in an effort to support the idea that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he made available healing, but it's not going to happen for everyone until eternity. Why? Because Isaiah 53 could be one of those mountaintop prophecies. But I would like to share with you another one to support this mountaintop prophecy idea from Luke chapters 3 and 4. This, we are going to go a-wandering along the mountain trails because this is a little circuitous, but I think it will be worth the journey ultimately. Luke chapter 3, Jesus begins his ministry. He's at the river, and we see, sorry my modalist friends, a great picture of the Trinity. The Father speaks from heaven, the dove descends, on the Son, Jesus Christ. Three distinct persons, one God. What are we seeing there? We're seeing Jesus, the God-man. Remember, he set aside his rights to act as God. How did he do all the miracles that he did? How did he know the future? How did he resist temptation? It was by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is huge. We need to remember, if we want to see what does it look like for a man to be totally under the control of the Holy Spirit, we need to take a look at Jesus Christ himself. When you see somebody who claims that they're a spirit-filled preacher causing the Spirit to descend on people and they're barking like dogs, Jesus never did that, and he was totally controlled by the Spirit. In Luke chapter 4, we see Jesus in the wilderness, I believe, as a picture of Israel. Remember, the nation of Israel, they were rescued out of Egypt. Jesus was taken out of Egypt because, strangely it seems, Matthew says that Israel is actually a picture of Jesus. However, the original Israel didn't do such a good job. When they were in the wilderness, they kept sinning and sinning and sinning. When Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, he never sinned. He was the better Israel. In fact, three times when the devil tempted him, Jesus responded with three quotes from Moses at the end of the wilderness wanderings. Jesus is the better Israel. We see him resisting temptation in the wilderness by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, led by the Spirit, he goes back to his hometown where he goes to a synagogue. If you recall, synagogues, they were like, spin-off churches of the temple. The synagogues were scattered all around Israel and really all around the Mediterranean, which made it very helpful for Paul later on when he brought the gospel at just the right time to people who were dispersed. So Jesus, showing up at the synagogue in his hometown, he opens up, he opens up the scroll, do it like this, and he turns it to a prophecy in Isaiah 69. Jesus starts reading the prophecy. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. More Spirit of the Lord, because God has anointed me to do what? Preach the good news, the gospel to the captives, 
to declare the day of the Lord, the appointed time. And then he rolls up the scroll, sits down, and says, Today, this prophecy was fulfilled in your hearing. Staggering. Now, at first, they actually embraced him and went, Oh, he's such a good speaker. We really like this guy. What's the point of all of this? When you go back and you take a look at that prophecy in Isaiah 69, Jesus only read part of it. After talking about, I'm anointed by God to preach good news to the captives, to proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord, he stops, but the actual prophecy continues. What does the next sentence say? And to declare the vengeance of the Lord. Why did Jesus stop when he was talking about, I'm here anointed by God himself by the power of the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel because that was his assignment at that time. The prophecy says he's also supposed to declare the vengeance of God, to bring the vengeance of God. But not then, not yet. When will Jesus do that? At the end of the age, at the end of time, at the end of the church age, eschatology time. He came first to preach the gospel, to preach forgiveness, anointed by the Holy Spirit. He stopped the prophecy then, even though the prophecy continues and says that this same Messiah is going to be dealing with vengeance. Why? Because Jesus, I believe, recognized that the prophecy of Isaiah was going to be fulfilled in parts. In other words, in mountaintop prophecies. Why is this so important that we understand this? Well, it's going to help you understand how things happen and when things happen. And specifically in our instance, it helps us to remember Jesus Christ in his atonement made possible healing, complete and total. It's going to happen, just not yet. Don't be discouraged. Don't grow weary. Don't be frustrated. Don't think God isn't listening. Don't think that God isn't able. He's fully able. He's just possibly not going to do it yet. But you have his word. He will do it at the resurrection. Read 1 Corinthians 15 and you will see it for yourself. You and your loved ones will get an eternal disease-free body that will go on forever but not yet. Until tomorrow, go serve your king. No kidding, this is my impersonation of every person I walked by in downtown Bucharest, Romania when I was there a number of years ago. and hopeless. Why, for decades, Romania lived underneath the iron fist of communist dictator Nicolae Ceausescu and the gospel was stifled. To this day, evangelical Christianity has not found a foothold in Romania, but great news, Tomorrow Clubs is ready to launch from the 400 Tomorrow Clubs they have in Ukraine to invade Romania with the gospel. If you love this country, please, would you help the Tomorrow Clubs? Visit the website, tomorrowclubs.org. Let's bring some joy, let's bring some good news to the people of Romania by supporting a Tomorrow Club.